I don't think I need to, whatever that is, I can't see it. What is it, scan something? No, I don't want to ask that, that's not my computer. And I can't even see it. I can't even see anything on the computer, I just push the return button. Add button? Cancel? Well, I can't, I, I don't see, there's nothing on the screen. Ah, this one's good. I want to use my computer. All right. So this one is uh, one electrode or two electrodes to be used in this situation. Uh, so all basically can be So it's not uh, I don't I mean, it's not great. What you want is 100%. Reduction because if you don't, then there's a lot of nerves going on. It's not what you can't talk about. So I came up with this idea that I want to do it on the road. I want to do it on the road. 
the idea was to set up two things in the very nice and we simulate the white map, the power of 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 so we have to get into two sides of two things that are together at one point. So we don't call it a little bit of 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 a little the model is uh, one that is not coming from each of them because it's too early to do that once in the past. And then we use it here and then we wait about two months to do it And then it works in the case of each one. You've got spontaneous here, very well, no stimulation. And there are a number of two of them, they use three, four, four days. So this one is similar to using strong patients out of the air And then we place electrodes in this flat to go to the different And we see what it's going to be. And it's going to be the same. I didn't believe it before. I had people who are using that experiment and didn't have a lot of people. And uh, there is still some of these uh, after effects that I said is this is really simple. I don't know how to find it. And the other one is that it's the fact that all the people are in that one. So then, for me, and it's possible. Well, I can't find out whether it's a very simple position, very well in the past. I can't get it to use it. And I'm talking to the other one. Washington, D.C., Dr. Uh, what we did is, uh, we started to do a 
So to do this, can you do the uh, here's what the most of these do to report the mirror currently. Here's the mirror. There's the mirroring, there's the tactical, there's the mirror, and then the other mirror is the last one So we need to go over on this. Talk about a little bit. Here's another one for uh, the live video, live video, this is a video, and you store it in the nerve, and then you come back in there, this is a time like this, and you take the video, and then you come back to the screen, and then you take 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 the screen, and so here's the plan that we have that has in mind. Uh, the idea is to go to the space, and we can do it like that. That is, that we share the dimensions and the enhancement properties of the So here is the secret sharing area in there, and then you see that one, and then you see the enhancement space as a rise. Include the and you heard that from uh, uh, previously you um, discovered in various information. And we are currently doing investigation. So most of the sites that you see there were able to classify two sites that are changed in their way to change into an hypothesis. And 
Solving this global and helping.
Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Mr. for for the kind invitation. And, and my talk will follow, I think, nicely the one from uh, Dominic. Uh, and what I hope to, to do today is to emphasize uh, the integration that uh, we have done over the years from a training in neuroscience and a recent and, and an interest in, in peripheral neural interfaces. So my lab started and has worked for a number of years in peripheral nerve regeneration. And that is trying to understand under which circumstances you can get nerves that have a gap because of pollution. As you can, you can um, get them to cross long gaps, longer than three centimeters. That doesn't normally happen so spontaneously. Then from that expertise, or from that interest, we got invited somehow to, to start working on peripheral new interfaces with the idea of uh, guiding axons towards new uh, multi-electro arrays uh, with the idea of uh, recording motor intent and also stimulating uh, or sensory neurons to evoke a perception. And hopefully I'll have time to tell you a little bit more uh, of the recent work that I'm doing on neuromas and neuroma prevention, particularly neuroma pain evoked by electromagnetic fields. So peripheral new interfaces, I think Dominique gave us a very good introduction. This is a list of some of the uh, many types of interfaces that you can see already reported both in the literature as well as, as in use in the clinic. Uh, extra neural electrodes, cough electrodes, they last for 10 years, but they are not sensitive enough. They don't give you single spikes. If you want to get those uh, single neurons, you know, so probably will get the highest sensitivity and resolution if you use regenerative uh, interfaces, but and those will require for you to transect the nerve and the nerve will regrow through a sieve electrode. This one was developed at least 20 years ago. And the interest of this, obviously, in addition to move and feel from bionic uh, devices, has been recently uh, pushed by the idea of uh, bioelectronics, right? The idea of being able to record from autonomic uh, nerves as well as neuromodulators with the hope of getting to treat diseases. So my, uh, our contribution really was a number of years ago to get neurons to regrow on, uh, on an open architecture, right? Without um, the sieve, when the problem with the sieve is when you get actions to grow through little holes, the neurons will go through them because when they elongate, there are about one micron. And then they grow to 12 to 20 microns and they constrict. So that's definitely not, not, not a good deal. Uh, so what we did is to have a FMA, it's a floating multi array, 16 electrodes plus uh, reference in the ground. Neurons over time will grow back, and if you do that, we test that in a sciatic nerve in the rat, and this is how the nerve looks after it regrows. Uh, we were able to show by having a connector that you can record uh, the activity from these neurons or as the animal to do locomotive uh, activity, as well as when you evoked a sensation by touching the pole with a frame bone for a filament. We're able to see that uh, you can evoke all types, you can record from these uh, peripheral nerves all types of uh, activities. Sensor activity is small, uh, is slow adapting, fast adapting uh, mechanosensors. You can evoke the response of all those, but it's obviously random, right? This is one example by which we have this rat walking on a treadmill. We study the, um, the gait and we try to coordinate and prepare the activity of the stepping cycle with the recording that we have. I'm showing you only three channels here and one example of single unit. Basically, only one channel is showing, a couple of channels is showing some activity, not much going on. This is when the rat is standing on the treadmill without the treadmill being started. When we start the treadmill, then this is what you see. 
obviously there's an opportunity there in all these three channels and you can start looking at uh, new spikes that are common. But the question here is which of these spikes is more activity and which of those are proprioception or, or mechanoception? And that's, that turns out to be not an easy problem to solve. And the, the problem lies in, in the sense that there are 27,000 saxons in, the, in this particular nerve, in the sciatic nerve of the rat, and only a thousand of those are motor. So you're looking for the needle in the haystack. And we try to, to find the motor intent, and you, you do that, that by having the array placed on a mostly motor uh, branch, a fascicle like a tibial, which uh, innervates the gastrointestinal muscle. Uh, you do the same type of experiment, you can see that there is some activity that correlates with the stepping cycle. Uh, we have to put some uh, botulinotoxins to prevent the, motor, the, the muscle from contracting to be able to see if we can find the nature of these spikes. Turns out these spikes are um, uh, proprioceptive, they're not really, a uh, motor not really proprioceptive in this particular case, but it's, they're, they're rare. You, you don't see these spikes that, this spike that often. So, well, you can record motor intent, perhaps using this regenerative multi electro interface. Uh, can you stimulate those nerves and evoke a sensation? Obviously, the motivation is because the now there are a number of devices that can be adapted to these robotic limbs that will give you pressure, that will give you movement and temperature and so on. And the way we convey, uh, um, we started conveying uh, sensation was by this uh, ectopic place when you put a, a probe and, and you know, touches the, the arm. Well, recently, Dominic, not Dominic, Dustin Tyler and others have used cough electrodes to stimulate directly on the peripheral nerve. And you get some sensation and feedback to the user. The problem is that for the most part, you can evoke paresthesias. Uh, that is a abnormal sensation of tingling, of a burning, and sometimes if you do some, some uh, modulations of the, of the stimulation, you can get some uh, perception of movement. Now, the problem again there is that naturally we have about 20 different sensory modalities that are coming from about eight or seven different fibers that carry a specific sensory information. And many of them, you cannot distinguish them anatomically or biophysically, right? All the mechanoceptors have uh, a small, medium sized myelinated axons. They are different because of the sensor, they're not different because of the axon. And when you look at a transected amputated nerve in an amputee subject, you don't have those specialized sensors. So it seems to me that at that moment we start thinking about can we guide these axons using molecular biology. So here's what the training, my neuroscience trainers are influencing the way we think about these, these things, right? Uh, if you looked at the peripheral nerve, you probably look at, at a very homogeneous structure, but if you look at the developmental uh, markers or developmental signals that contribute to the, how they feel. So this is a specific transcription factors that are expressed in different subpopulation of motor, pool, motor neurons in the spinal cord. And this is a, this is in, during development, this is a picture of a dorsal root ganglion in, in an adult. And you can see that these neurons are different, right? They have different receptors, they have different neuropeptides, and they follow different neurotropic factors or, or uh, neurotropic guidance cues in their path to their targets. They start mixed proximally to the spinal cord. This is the picture that shows at least the motor actions being expressed in GFA, GFP, and eventually they segregate. Uh, how do they do that? Well, we know a lot of at least quiles. We know uh, some of the molecules that play a role during development and how these neurons find the targets, efferent receptors, for instance, play an uh, important role. But during development, this is, something, this is work that I did with George Smith, during development, uh, sorry, in an adult, um, we can use uh, viral vectors to re-express neurotrophins. In this picture, I'm showing you, um, showing you the image of the final four. This is a dorsal rhizotomy, rhizotomy model, in which case you uh, cut the dorsal root and that innervates the dorsal part of the spinal cord. And then after 15 days later, you can inject the viral vectors, in this case, an antenna viral vectors to express either LAC, NGF, or DFDF. And what you can see that over time is that the normal inhibitory environment of the spinal cord can be overcome uh, or overcame by um, these growth factors. So growth factors can be used to guide axons into 
uh, a particular target in the adult. The thing that we did when I was with Luis uh, was to uh, found that there are also some inhibitors that can block that had a role both in development as well as in the adult. This is a, not a mouse, I think that's a book there too, so we will play it. But this mouse was, okay, it's not going to play. Well, uh, that mouse pops like a rabbit. And the reason that it does that is because we eliminate a protein that is expressed in the mouse. This is like FNB3 protein, which is a inhibitor for quantum final neurons. So normally this by cell itself prevent the vertical spinal tract access from recrossing once they went across the midline. If you eliminate the barrier, then there is crystals, and in that case, the angle of the human cell is the real thing, so it cannot do as it is. This is a neuron that is expressed in the epic core receptor. If you do this assay with the line expressing SFDP, you can see that the neuron that the receptors cannot walk over that, cannot cross that inhibitory path. So there are attractants and inhibitors molecules that are can, that work to the development as well as in the adult. So very quickly, so what we did since then was to propose to have a wide space assay in vivo by which we would have either uh, NTF or NTF attractant. Uh, and compare that to like the tubes that we have a pseudo for a figure now. This is a pseudo for the figure. Compare that with a single tube. And if you don't have a gene factor on the other then it's going to split, but it won't be a great content of actions. If you put a growth factor such as NDF, and as you see, you probably get something that resembles better the normal action of this stuff. It turns out that this worked for NGF better than it worked for MT3. And we didn't show any evidence of, uh, of this little uh, fascicle being electroactive, and we didn't show any track tracing or um, EM. All that work has been done right now, and I hope to publish uh, some uh, that, that work soon for you to, to review it. But the point here that I want to make is you can use molecular guidance, guidance cues to modulate the content of axons or fascicles into chambers. So. Now we can increase the content of bottom neurons uh, here threefold and on sensor neurons about 11 fold for these chambers. Therefore, I will be able to record at a graded probability in that chamber and stimulate. Ideally, you will be able to modulate the modality of those sensory axons to be able to get um, better stimulation anyway. So then most recently through the comments that we received of uh, DSA, we were also among the, the group with Dominic, trying to record and simulate from autonomic nerves. And this is where the challenges are. First of all, if you compare uh, an EM picture of a somatic nerve compared to one of an autonomic nerve, the first thing that comes to you is that these ones are smaller, about half of their size, take up, uh, they're less manually, they're more fragile. And some of them could be as small as 50 to 100 microns, just as the carotid sinus nerve that Dominic talked about. Uh, the surgery has become more co problematic. They're close to nerves, they're close to uh, arteries, pulsing arteries. Recording the stimulated from these are a little bit difficult. We, pair, we uh, collaborated with uh, Dr. Boyd, and he developed over uh, the last three to five years, I believe, this um, polyacrylate um, softening polymer. Uh, it's a shape memory polymer that uh, softens about 100 fold when you change the temperature. Um, this is if this one is my play. Uh, this is a, a electrical model, a 16 electrical array we made. It also, you try to bend that over a uh, glass roll, uh, 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 saline is hard to do that, but if you do that, or you want to do it the same. Uh, frames, then it bends over quite nicely and retains the shape. So um, you can use this uh, 
or it's more than that. This is actually a kind of thing that we have in the past. So we have multiple electrons to fit multiple uh, sizes. These are kind of simulated electrons that we have found. We have kind of like a coding of the ones in the center of the center, as you can see, that's all electrons for uh, the coding. Uh, let's see what else. All right. It's an example of recording that we have after a few days, maybe seven days. We have seven days after implementation. Fourteen of these were probably seven beginnings, so I have to flash in a little bit. Okay, we need to fill guard, and we should have now a loader device, and we can get for six days next. Then we reserve, so we can fly the AFM fourteen by the fourth, we can see the activity of the Vegas nerve. We've done this with the um, nerve, the pelvic nerve, and uh, a number of other nerves as well. So, lectures, we also think about the, the wireless uh, simulation. Uh, of, what I didn't tell you before is that the Remy, the experiments that we did with the regenerative interface fail uh, many times, most of the time because of breakage of the wires and the connection. So we, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, devices that we're testing with collaborators. This is from Daniel Freeman at Draper, where he developed a uh, super linear cycle. So here, this is his comparison with the bio. Uh, this is the Stanford cycle, uh, and this is the one that Dan Freeman made. OK, fine. That's perfect. This one has um, it's a single simulator has about 250, 250 turns and the coil is magnetically conducted. And oh, if this one moves, I'll be able to show some. Yeah. Well, we tested this in the animal, and I want to show you a movie of animal um, moving, we've implanted this into the into the sciatic nerve. Uh, you can evoke a motor response. Sorry, this is not moving. But you can evoke a response from a distance about six centimeters uh, implanted. We have now made um, encapsulated devices that are viable chronically into rats and rabbits. And they're working after a few months. I won't be able to show you any of that because it's not, oh, there you go. This is a rat uh, setup. Recording of the uh, limb movement of a few diff different settings. And I want to play the movie, but we can't, we can't so imagine that for moving up and down uh, as you apply this stimulation. This uh, device is stimulated at 10 megahertz. And it puts about 25 microamps of current, which is about is sufficient for the type of looking forward to achieve. The next, the last uh, part of the talk uh, will be to, again, once this moves on, will be a multi electro ray. This is a, a troic help us uh, uh, control using his, uh, his chip, his wireless chip. This one has 16 electrodes, and he can independently control each one of those electrodes and control the wave. Uh, and I have told you this is monopolar stimulation. Does have anything to control it? This is basically an on and off switch. The one from Piltroid gives you um, a little more control. And and well, so I'll just give you the story. Uh, we implanted that one for more than a year, for 14 months. It was viable during all those months, every, so all, those, uh, all that time, every month, we recorded the threshold that each one of those electrodes uh, needed to evoke the response. 16 electrodes, and you can implant those into, I don't know if I can get out of this thing. Let's, uh, no. Yeah. So it's hard to, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Uh, oh, if I can see it. I can see it. Okay. All right. 
16 electrons, right, in, in the air. So you basically have a, now you have a set in there that have a trivial common coronal chain zero. And when you have an electron ray, you have four electrons over, 16 electrons over the left of the two, right? And each one of those electrons is, right, is placed in a different task force. So you can evoke the vortex flexion or a plant perfection depending on where these electrons are. And you can do that sustainably over time for, as I said, more than a year. The ability to do that wires in using a wireless uh, chip um, to, uh, to test the uh, encapsulation. This was encapsulated with silicon. There was no other fancy encapsulation. And it was just, if you clean the silicon, and there was probably another step that, that built and um, that we're able to, to get this device working. So now, obviously, we're spending on the use of that particular chip. And, um, okay, so out of memory. Um, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know. I was to, to tell you. So, so the, the number of, uh, number of tests with that particular device. Um, maybe I will just tell you what happened in the last, last part of my talk, neuromas and neuroma pain. I met uh, a retired major, uh, he served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he lost his arm due to an IPV. Uh, he came to us, uh, and eventually he told me that he felt pain when he drives through close to a cell phone tower or when somebody in his car is has is receiving a call and, and his cell phone is, is roaming. Uh, we set up an mo animal model uh, of uh, amputation in our lab, and we use an RFID antenna. People question, is that possible that you can get pain? And if that's so, what would be the possible mechanism? So you put this RFID antenna that runs at 915 uh, megahertz, about 18 inches from the rat, and the rat is, uh, you put that on top of the rat. This is the devices that are in, in many warehouses, okay? Uh, to our surprise, if you injure the nerve, uh, the animal will feel pain immediately. Now, this is not a pain that is reflection of pain everywhere. It's not a scratching the, the ears. It's not everywhere. It knows exactly where the injury is. Uh, by the way, the way I did it, I take the peroneal nerve, retract it, and divert that goes to the femur. So the area of the toe that normally is innervated uh, is no longer innervated. It's like a off. Yeah, the animal is living exactly in that particular place, nowhere else, no, nowhere else, else. None of the jam animals, except one time over 28 weeks, responded. So that, just going to conclude with that, there are two, two take-home messages from that, those experiments. Uh, number one, I think, oh, by the way, this was correlated with increasing TPRV4 channels uh, at the neuroma site. But um, nerves that are not injured, uh, well, in animals that you have any nerve injury, they, they did not respond to RFM with any pain sensors, which kind of correlates with the fact that many of us, billions of people, were uh, user work and did not, don't, they don't report any abnormal feelings or pain. Yet there are some, a small fraction of the population, that have hypersensitivity to uh, EMF. And the result, very preliminary from this first study in our lab, indicates or suggests that nerve injury. Um, if you have an air injury and there is an inflammation, obviously you have hypersensitivity and that may change and that may actually be a factor that will um, contribute, at least in some people, uh, to, to, to feel pain. That's for the inconvenience of the technology, but that's it. Thank you so much. It is. It's so the problem with the bion has been smooth. In fact, it was sending because it was really tough to do it. And first of all, it's in the So why is it just taking the Well, with this one is anchored to a cup. Uh, the cup, this one is actually completely anchored to a cup. I mean, we're, we're doing other way. Yeah. It, it's different. We're not actually using the device currently as a, uh, a standalone stimulator. We're using that to power a cough and therefore be able to control better the current. So it is a, it's a slightly different. Okay. So, 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 so
Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, our, our next speaker, Paul Bonato, one of our hosts for the Middle East Middle East Conference. Paul um, is director of the Analysis Lab at the Christian Art School at the University of Harvard. Um, he's a leader in the field of commercial technology and organization. I know that he's a founding uh, editor um, of the Journal of Wales and Wales. My, my recommendation is not yeah. <laughs> yeah, we will do that tomorrow. So I apologize about that. Yeah, we, we ran into some Microsoft uh, issues actually. Sorry about that. And we resolve it in the way Microsoft products require by just killing the process and restarting the operating system. So, so it works perfectly well, let's see. So I'll be um, very short because I can see that we're supposed to, we were supposed actually to wrap this up in four minutes. So I'll, I'll give myself 10, 15, and then uh, the Pons will be the last speaker. So uh, I'll talk to you a bit about some of the um, translational work that we're doing at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. And I'll talk about a couple of technologies. The way that I want to introduce them is by, is by showing you a very concrete example which is the use of technologies in a population that's actually the prevalent population of amputees that uh, we see in rehabilitation hospital, which is contrary to what you would be inclined to think looking at pickers uh, that are typically focused on young traumatic amputees. The larger portion of the population is actually individuals who would lose their limb secondary to diabetes. Uh, this is a very difficult population to work with, and that's a population that more or less uh, the clinicians almost give up on, right? And so, so what they're going to get is typically very pathology that is very, very uh, counterintuitive given this is a population that really requires um, technology to re-enable function. So whereas young uh, traumatic amputees would actually be able to function pretty decently with a low-tech uh, prosthetic devices, most of these individuals would not even be able to get up from a wheelchair and therefore they will spend the rest of their life most likely in a wheelchair which is of course uh, tragic from a medical point of view. So what we have tried to do with lots of challenges to do uh, recently is to work with our colleagues at the MIT Media Lab to develop this prosthetic device based actually on some of the mechanical models that we develop and then they commercialize it and this is a, a prosthetic device that provides through robotics uh, plant reflection, active plant reflection. But of course, this would be um, like giving a bed driver a Porsche and then expect that they're going to do well. So, so that's, that's not going to happen. So what you have to do is to combine this with proper training and proper monitoring of the behavior of the individual. And so what we're doing is that we're using uh, wearable technology to actually monitor individuals and provide them with feedback as, as we move along with the intervention. And these, in fact, are the two technologies that I want to talk to you very briefly about. So what I just mentioned is an example of what we call secondary prevention. So it's essentially avoiding complications of an existing condition. First, what we would like to do best is to avoid, to begin with, that we will get into these types of situations. And lots of people, particularly for instance, uh, for the uh, condition I just mentioned, they do it through remote monitoring of individuals uh, in the home and community settings. This is uh, taken from a paper that we published a few years ago and reflects most of the uh, technology that has been developing in the field. Uh, there is, for instance, a, a seminar paper by uh, Emily Ivanov about more than 10 years ago that uh, provided this sort of schematic representation of what we're trying to attempt with this technology. So I want to show you a concrete example of it. So I'll cut it to the chase and just get to showing just use, uh, the use of this technology in the management of the long-term condition. And, and of course, I'm focusing because of my background on conditions that are chronic conditions or uh, neurodegenerative conditions. And in this particular case, particular case, I'm showing you the application of this technology 
for the purpose of titrating medications in individuals with late stage Parkinson's disease. This is a population and that are uh, characterized by uh, motor symptoms that are stereotypic, such as tremor, bradykinesia, which is this lowness of movement, dyskinesia, which are very hyperkinetic movements, uh, problems with the control of balance that I believe most of you as observed, unfortunately, in real life, because unfortunately this is a condition that is quite um, uh, found quite often in the uh, older uh, in older adults. So, in typical individual respond relatively well to interventions in the early stages, but over time they develop what are called motor fluctuations. So they go through a roller coaster essentially in between medication intakes, and unfortunately, because of the condition that they are affected by, they don't have a an objective perception of their motor status. So the titration of medication becomes quite complex because they go through these periods, for instance, uh, of uh, dyskinesia, as is shown in this picture between two medication intakes. In fact, there are typical would be uh, a spike essentially in the severity of uh, dyskinesia at the onset, so at, uh, the transition between on off and off, right immediately after the medication intake. And then again, at the end of those, when the medication is wearing off, there are patients would, in fact, experience uh, this worsening of their dyskinesia at peak dose. You know? And you can think of all these symptoms of motor complications that I mentioned earlier to actually occur in combination with this fluctuation shown here for dyskinesia, but with not, not in phase, essentially, with uh, the dyskinetic movements. So what we need to capture, we need to capture in subjects who unfortunately don't have the ability to provide an objective report of their motor status to um, capture or monitor over time these changes in the motor behavior. This is taken if the subject is performing motor tasks that are part of a standardized uh, neurological assessment. And you see uh, we're focusing here on the severity of this kinesia. And you see um, the baseline condition what we see on the left side. Uh, movements of the lower extremity, for instance, that are relatively high frequency, uh, characterized by high frequency components that are associated with tremor, whereas on the right hand side you see more right hip movements that are actually character, uh, associated with this condition. And so what we want to do is to capture this change that occur longitudinally, and we want to do it automatically through collected using sensing technology. Uh, of course, I, I wouldn't talk about this if uh, we have been successful in achieving this goal. And we've done this in numerous publications, like many uh, other uh, researchers. And what we have done is to monitor these uh, individuals then over periods of, uh, for instance, uh, a year, as is shown uh, in this slide, and, and monitor their changes as they occur longitudinally. Uh, you can see here we took essentially a window of observation at three points, three points in time over a period of about uh, 10, uh, 10 months. And you see uh, the changes that occur longitudinally. What we see in these plots uh, are the um, fluctuations in the severity of tremor, but the kinesia and dyskinesia in different colors. And this symbol represents the medication intake. And you, see, you can see the different behaviors that are occurring over time. And this object, in fact, would undergo the changes in the medication intake. And this was part of the attempt to titrate their medications. What we're currently doing is to expand these studies by looking at uh, evolving from the technology that we use in our uh, first study to technologies um, that have been uh, made more recently available. Together with the Michael J. Fox Foundation, we experimented with technology, a technology platform that Intel uh, pulled together. And we have the results that are going to come out soon. We're also um, carrying out uh, data collections with BioStems by MC10, uh, shown in the pictures what John Rogers did. Um, before they developed the BioStem, the BioStem was a slightly different form factor, but it's one of these uh, very um, intrusive sensors that you can use uh, to monitor uh, a variety of physiological signals and, and biomedical signals. We're interested in expanding these to gathering contextual information which we do by using uh, wearable cameras.
this is our long-term vision. I don't think it requires any explanations. We want to be in Italy and joining our retirement age <laughs> and just do shopping all day long and just riding a bike. This was taken by one of my former postdocs, so Shama Patel is now working uh, with the MathWorks, and it's clearly inspired by an advertisement by United Healthcare that you probably have seen. And it's all the concept is the one of monitoring essentially individuals um, in the field continuously so as to prevent uh, or, or best manage uh, their conditions. For those of you who are curious about it, uh, this, this was a fantastic advertisement back then. But you know, interesting, United Healthcare actually has never pro provided a product that allows you, that I know, that provides you this type of capability. So good room for us to actually contribute to a vision that's clearly out there. So we can possibly just monitor individuals. We are in a rehabilitation hospital. We have people coming through the door. They have, of course, mobility limiting conditions, an amputation a neurodegenerative condition, like the one that I mentioned earlier, we need also to look into interventions to actually restore motor capabilities. So this is often achieved by using robotic systems. And as a point, we'll talk, uh, I believe, more about the capa capability of uh, relying upon robotics to augment uh, functions, or, or perhaps something else to surprise, we will see. But I want to uh, talk briefly about the training motor functions by using this technology. This is fascinating. Uh, people in our field in, in neuro engineering rehabilitation have rely upon this technology and develop a variety of different uh, type of variations of this technology over the past uh, 20 years. Interesting, uh, we haven't paid a lot, enough, a lot of attention to the outcomes of uh, the interventions that are uh, achieved by using these uh, uh, technologies. And when we look at it a bit more closely, um, as opposed to look at these results on a group basis, we start realizing that there is a large variability across individuals. And that goes into um, topics that have been discussed earlier today by many speakers. And what we are trying to convey in the next uh, few slides is that what we actually ought to do is to study more carefully the use of these technology and then individualize interventions as opposed to use these technologies as if they were going to work with all subjects. But there are quite a few areas of potential research uh, that's associated with the refinement of the use of the technology in actual interventions. But the one that I want to talk to you about briefly is the study of the interaction bef between robotic systems and, um, and, and patients. And what we have done, uh, and I'll, I'll just give you sort of uh, quickly through two slides, the gist of it, is that we have, we have tried to integrate some of the motor control principles that have been developed by other researchers, unfortunately, uh, with primary focus on anti control subjects. We've tried to do that um, in patients by translating these concepts uh, from experiments that have been performed in the past for movements uh, that are associated or characteristics of movements that are associated with arm reaching a type of task. We've tried to do the same for the lower limbs. Particularly, we've used a paradigm that's called the four skill adaptation paradigm, which means that we're using the interaction with a robotic system uh, by creating force field to uh, explore the way the central nervous system of that specific individual is actually responding to the perturbation produced by the robots. So for the upper extremity, that has been done in the past by looking at arm reaching movements that are typically straight line, uh, as the subject is holding onto the distal component of a robotic arm and uh, by introducing perturbations that are velocity dependent. So that means that the subject is performing these average movements uh, for a certain number of times, let's say one of the repetitions, and then the robotic system all suddenly, without warning, is introducing a push that's either lateral or media. And that's a function of the speed at which the subject is moving. And what people have shown, again, in anti control subjects, is that at this actually causes a reaction by the subject, which we call a motor adaptation strategy. So the subject actually compensates for the force field generated by the robot. 
and therefore returns to actually move through a straight line. And if you remove that, you see what we call the after effect. So you see the fact that the subject had developed an internal model of the perturbation, had generated forces, so about the artificial strategy to counter it, and now all of a sudden you remove the perturbation, and the subject expecting the perturbation is actually deviating from the original trajectory. So we have done the same for the lower limbs by taking a device that's utilized actually for clinical interventions, and we have generated these force fields around now the joint coordinate system. We were looking into the trajectory of the hip versus the knee flexion extension purely the sagittal plane, and we have introduced force fields, for instance, to increase knee flexion and hip flexion. The sub subject respond to this type of perturbations, and then we have removed them and see, in fact, if they demonstrate a, a, a after effect. This is done by taking multiple trials of, of each of these uh, uh, gait cycles. In, in this case, we think we're looking at locomotion. So what we see here is, in fact, a demonstration that this is an adaptation type of process. In blue, you see a number of trials when this robotic system is essentially transparent to the subject, then a force field is introduced. That's what you see in green. And you see the deviation from uh, what we have observed at baseline conditions. This is done by increasing the flexion uh, during the swing phase of the head cycle. And then we remove the force field. That's what you see actually in red. How do we know that's, a two, that's an actual adaptation? Because if we take, for instance, the average across the, uh, uh, the three phases that I just described, and we look, for instance, at deviations from the average or from the baseline at one point in time, you see actually uh, the plot that you got on the bottom of this slide. So you see variability and essentially the position of these points in the gate cycle from uh, cycle to cycle, so stripe to stripe. And then you see the deviation that corresponds to the introduction of the force field. You see an exponential here that corresponds to the compensation by the subject to the external field. And then once you actually remove the perturbation, you see a deviation in the opposite direction that returns gradually to base. So what do we want to do with that? We want to actually use this type of probing of the motor behavior of the individual to assess whether that type of uh, robotic system and interaction with it is actually suitable on an individual basis. And interesting, this is something that we haven't done neither on the engineering side nor on the clinical side of our business. So what do we do if the subject doesn't show this capability, right? So, so we have to design interventions around it. And one way to design an intervention is the one of augmenting the capability of the individual, which you, you could do through actual motor training if you have uh, conditions that affect, for instance, the ability of the individual to coordinate muscles, but for instance, strength and the ability to uh, activate these muscles in isolation is in place. Or you can try to augment the capability of the individual to actually learn uh, from um, from the interaction with the robot. One way to do it is by um, boosting uh, uh, low dopamine tone. And, and we have uh, three individuals in the lab interested in doing work in this area. We recently wrote a uh, review position paper on this. And uh, they're actually here, they're part of the group that's helping with the organization. Um, Jean-Francois Denon, uh, Katrina Dandester, and uh, uh, Gloria. The gallery. So uh, you are welcome to talk directly to them if you are interested in this. So on this basis, what we will do is that we will run in parallel a, a series of tests that would allow us to do both genotyping as well as the phenotyping of these individuals. And in this slide, we shall look in at, for instance, on the top of the slide, uh, the dopamine return uh, of, of these individuals and selecting essentially subsets of individuals in the individuals on the basis of what we predict to be their ability to learn. And on the bottom, you see the results, for instance, of tests like the robotic tests that I just uh, demonstrated. So in conclusion, what I wanted to show you very briefly tonight is how we are trying to use technology to enhance our capability to improve motor functions in individuals by both augmenting their uh, function, but through uh, in combination with learning and monitoring uh, responses on the basis of the robotic
technology. That's what I wanted to uh, show you tonight. This is the group that has been working on this topic. And this is my contact information because it's already 6.14. I will skip the question and I will pass the podium to Jose Pons. Thank you very much for your attention. Dismissed.